Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the Nehru Center High Commission of India and Vatayan, I welcome you all to commemorate late Sri Girish Karnarji today at the Nehru Center. I would say Girish Karnarji uh, as you all are aware, has served as director, Nehru Culture Center, as well as Minister Culture at the High Commission of India for three years. During his tenure, of course, there is no doubt saying that his contribution towards propagation of culture, not even culture, the literature to the society, not from India, even across the world, is unforgettable. Today, we are gathered here to commemorate and paying a tribute to him in the shape of celebration, his life and works. And I think it would be a great opportunity for everyone. Those people who have worked with him knew him very well and had a beautiful acquaintance to, you know, remember him with their words and experience not add to too much. I really would like to leave this uh, uh, platform and I would like to listen all of you and I may like to invite uh, uh, Divya ji to please proceed further. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my association with this building goes back to 1970. This building has served so many purposes. And in 1970, this building was catering some of the Indian companies. And the building next door used to be a car park, and before the car park used to be a 150-seater venue. The genesis of this building and its use, the purpose, came through a series of concerts. The great Lata Mangeshkarji gave three concerts at the Royal Albert Hall in 1974, March 1974, all sold out within announcement. The birth of Nehru Center was born there, and after expenses, a princely sum of 42,000 pounds was collected towards the building of Nehru Center. And 18 years later, the center was born. It had two directors prior to Girish Karnad, Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi and Professor Indranath Chaudhary. Girji came in the year 2000. He was man from the arts and theater, and I was ever so chuffed that such a man would take Nehru Center to new heights. I first met uh, a new off Girish Karnaji in a beautiful film set in a village uh, directed by Sham Banigal called Nishant. And this film, in this film, he acted as a schoolmaster a newly arrived schoolmaster with a wife and child. And much to his disappointment, uh, he faced uh, feudal landlords. And he was powerless. And in the film, his role was so important that throughout the film, you could see he was going pillar to post. And then he managed to galvanize support against the oppression of the village landlords. And this role he played actively towards the last part of his life that he stood for injustice in all areas. He was very informal, a lot of dialogues took place over the years when he was here. And I was also uh, very impressed with his broad background in the arts and many of his old friends are here. But today, 
I would like to share something more important that he brought informality to, to organizations. And anybody and everybody was welcome to talk to him without any fear. And that air of informality meant that he stood for greater ideals, as I discovered over the years, followed his career. And I, I can safely say that his contribution was vast. And the speakers who will follow me will uh, pay good respects and justify the man he was. And tonight, from my personal side, I uh, invite uh, uh, Anurag Dondiel uh, on vocal, uh, George Cook on cello, and Danny Arbiter on guitar to pay a musical tribute to Sri Girish Karnaji. And the song that they've chosen belongs to Kabir Das. Thank you. Check, check. So the song we're doing is called Neharva. Um, the essence of the meaning of the song is Kabir is saying that this materialistic world is not something that I am fond of. I want to be one with my beloved's house. I, I want to be in my beloved's house, be one with my beloved. And in a lot of ways, it's about leaving this materialistic world and moving beyond. And we thought it was just relevant today. And I'd like you guys to, to just close your eyes and be with yourself while the song is happening. It'll be beautiful at you if you can do that. Sai ki nagari Sai ki nagari Paramati sundar Ati sundar
आगे चलो पंथ नहीं सूझे पीछे दोष लगा दे के ही विधि ससुर Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to share a few thoughts with you. I met uh, Girish Kannad, and uh, I got to know him and his wife since the early 80s. When I heard that he was coming to uh, London at the Nehru Centre, all us Londoners were absolutely delighted because we knew it would mean that he would have meant that he would have had organized great cultural evenings and brought this place alive. He was not only... Uh, just such an all-rounder, such an intellectual, and such a wonderful person. But he was also greatly loved and respected, as is absolutely evidenced by the staff of the Nehru Center, who have organized this evening absolutely intuitively and with full of love and caring. And I just want to mention, I can't mention all the names, but Divya Mathur and Neelam Singh and all her team, they've been absolutely wonderful to organize tonight. I. I know that uh, Girish Kannad, as you all know, 
was a man who spoke his mind, and whether you agreed with him or not, he was fearless in saying what he believed in. Like many others, I know we all have lost a great friend, a unique person with a unique voice. I am very keen uh, to read out the two messages that uh, Radha, his daughter, and Raghu, his son, posted online. I think they are so heartfelt, and uh, for those who haven't read it online, I hope you won't mind um, that I'll, uh, I mean, those who have, I'll share again with you these messages. This, uh, the first one is from Radha, and we, uh, she says, while he was many things to many people, to us he was first and foremost Appa. With his clever hand shadows, the amazing ability to nap, his brightly colored kurtas and baggy pajamas, his endless collection of green pentels that always left an ink stain at his pocket. He was perfectly happy to just sit around and daydream while we potted and chatted and lived life around him. His grandsons lying on the floor uh, the, of his uh, drawing room while he rested. For Raghu, Karnad and I, the last few days have shown us how much we knew about Abba and how much we didn't. His awards and accolades and more meaningfully for, are for us. The personal stories and experiences of Abba. If you knew him and have a story or photograph or anecdote to share to help us remember him or get to know him better, and for his grandchildren could, to continue to learn about him as they grow up, please do share them with us. And then I'm reading you a passage that uh, Raghu wrote, which is equally lovely. As many friends have pointed out, he had an immaculate sense of timing. This past weekend, my sister and I were both at home for a friend's wedding, both at home means in Bangalore. On Saturday evening, he completed a set of audio interviews with Arshia Sattar. On Sunday evening, the family sat around, warmed by the long lines of sun on the terrace. We talked, um, uh, sorry, we, we talked, oh, sorry. I gave him his physio and my sister cut his nails. We talked about some new difficult issues with his body. It was sad, but not only sad. On Monday morning, he was gone. In the days since then, it's felt like a tribute to Appa that the house and my mind have been swirling with languages, Konkani, Kannada, Tamil, Malayalam, English, Hindi, without much incomprehension. We're all feeling a lot of love and gratitude. Thank you for the many messages about how you felt, enriched by his life and work. Thank you. I'm honored to be sharing my little tiny remembrance of him with all of you tonight on this sad and really also wonderful occasion. I got to know Girish um, through Alaknanda Samaj, who brought me here for the first time. I was then writing poetry columns in The Independent, and he was very interested in them. We started off talking about poetry, but we soon went on to theater. We went to theaters. We once went to Glyndebourne, it um, poured with rain, but he was absolutely delighted that the staff of the, of the Nehru Center found a very old, beautiful Tiffin pagoda that we could take our picnic in. And it was typical of him that on the train back, the rather wet, crowded train back, he met instantly somebody he'd worked with on a theater piece. Um, it was, he was sort of so interested in theater. And I was then starting um, research for this book, on tigers. I was going to start in India and go around the Asian world wherever tigers lived. And he said, but Ruth, you must start in the south, of course, and, um, and you must start with Kudiyatam. So he sent me to a friend of his called Rama Ayer um, in Kerala, in Trivandrum. And so the, really the beginning of my book is a piece on Kudiyatam. And he made quite sure that there are as many theatres in this book as there are tigers. And I thought, just in tribute to him, I wanted to read a poem which I wrote, which is about a tiger, an informal, private tiger, just drinking in the forest, not disturbed by anyone. Tiger drinking at forest pool. 
water, moonlight, danger, dream. Bronze urn angled on a tree root, one slash of light, then gone. A red moon seen through clouds or almost seen. Treasure found but lost, flirting between the worlds of lost and found. An unjust law repealed, a wish come true, a lifelong sadness healed. Haven in the mind to anyone hurt by littleness. A prayer for the moment saved, treachery forgiven, flame of the crackled glaze tangle, amber reflected in gray milk jade, an old song remembered, long debt paid, a painting on silk which may Thank you, Dr. Ruth Perrin. I now invite John Kay to come over and speak. I won't take my shoes off. If I take my shoes off, there won't be any time to say anything. Cast your minds back to 1960. Nehru was still Prime Minister in India. Harold Macmillan was in Downing Street and JFK was standing for President. No one had heard of the Beatles. Chubby Checker asked to twist again like he did last summer and Roy Orbison sung out his Only the Lonely. I have arrived at Maudlin, Oxford, after five years' detention in a monastic boarding school on the Yorkshire Moors, and I'm now installed in a large room beneath the Maudlin Tower, beside Maudlin Bridge, and above the Porter's Lodge. There's one other room on the same staircase. We share a landing, and we share the landing's solitary wash basin. The name on the door says Carnard. Kana DNK. Evidently, the rooms are allocated in alphabetical order. I investigate. Kana turns out to be an Indian. Though it's only October and not that cold, he's wrapped in several sweaters, a baggy tweed jacket, and a college scarf. And he gets his V's and W's mixed up all the time. I don't actually believe it, but in a whispered exchange, he's supposed once to have uttered the immortal words, I want a woman. I've never met an Indian before. His home state, he tells me, is Karnataka, which I've never heard of, and his first language, Canada, which I thought was in America. <laughs> He's written a play, and he has a Rhodes Scholarship. He gives me a rather somber-looking tie. I introduce him to Roy Orbison and Gordon's gin. We have absolutely nothing in common. Other Indians at Oxford are highly anglicised. They play tennis, and they regard the whole of England as a sort of club but not Carnard. This is his first trip outside India. He'd arrived by sea at Tilbury just a few months after the Empire Windrush tied up, and as a good Brahmin, he'd never touched beef. He has a little book on British etiquette that tells him how to hold a knife and fork and when to take a lady's hand. He knows no one, but he joins every club that's going. CND, the Labour Club, the Marjolies, the Arts, the Dramatic Society, the Oxford Union. This beef business can wait. I join nothing. I have a host of good friends and generally have a good time. Girish and I may not have much in common, but we get along okay. Well, because we were both scholars, we got to keep those same rooms and the shared wash basin and the landing for two years. In the depths of winter, we huddled round the combined output of our two single-bar electric fires. And by combining the rooms and disguising the wash basin, we were able to host some chaotic parties. Girish learned to live with my music, and I became mildly interested in India and increasingly delighted in my stairmate. But by 1963, our paths were diverging. 
I was heading for a dismal degree and a retail job in Oxford Street, while Girish was the toast of the town. As president of the Maudlin Junior Common Room and of the Oxford Union, there was nowhere else for him to go. Unusually, in the case of the Union, he was elected unopposed. He was so universally liked and loved that no one would stand against him. Nor did they oppose him over the long overdue admission of women to the Union, which passed during his presidency. The same was probably true of the JCR election. Everyone loved him so much and was convinced that he was one of theirs. The Marxists claimed him as a third world spokesman. Mystics claimed him as a real Indian and Muslims claimed him as a genuine secularist. At the time, he was writing Tughlaq, his play about the demented Delhi Sultan, Feroz Shah. In my copy, his dedication is typical in its cryptic intent. It reads simply, in praise of mad dogs and Englishmen, Girish. <laughs> <laughs> After such Oxford success, we, were all, we all assumed Girish would go into politics. We knew nothing about the senior side of Indian politics, and he was far too wise to be tempted. The Lok Sabha's loss was the Nehru Centres and the Sahitya Academies and our gain. I won't attempt to map out his career, but let me read out an email from a mutual friend of ours, Christina Noble, who's currently with the family in Bangalore. Christina says, what may be less known is his capacity for friendship. Personally, he has been a constant, reassuring, informative and fun friend for 60 years of my life, whether in India or Britain. I know that his time as the director of the Nehru Centre was a high spot of his later years. It enabled him to enjoy London, going to films, theatre and exhibitions, and to gather to the centre interesting people. It became a sort of club for many of us, important people and less important people. I remember my son and his girlfriend having a chat on the sofa with Amartya Sen, the Nobel Laureate. What may be less known was how important to him was the friendship between the staff and himself. He removed the exclusivity of the director's office, opening access to it to everyone. He valued the real friendship of those who worked with him. And in later years, he often mentioned to me that he would, he would tell me how they had phoned him to wish him a happy birthday. Obviously, it made him very happy. Well, very few of us could ever have hoped to emulate his achievements, but at Oxford, it wasn't the union that I envied him, or the JCR, or even his playwriting. It was his smoke rings. For no particular reason, he would drop out of the conversation, form his mouth into a perfect O, and like a child blowing bubbles, blowing soap bubbles, deliver a volley, deliver a volley of the most perfectly formed Virginia tobacco smoke rings I've ever seen. Sometimes he would attempt, this is a pièce de résistance, he would attempt the Olympic logo. You know, those five interlinked <laughs> rings, each of equal size. But to my mind, above all, it was a beatific smile that followed by way of a disclaimer, which made this whole performance so special. I can see it now. He said nothing. He just beamed. Will we ever see the like again? Will we ever see his like again? Like all of you here, I miss it dreadfully. Thank you. Thank you, John Kay. I now invite Chitra Sundaram to come over. Dear Divya, Divya, thank you for now and for all the wonderful times I've shared with you and Neelam and many others when this building could scarcely contain the incandescent energies and relentless range of emissaries that the one we speak of today, the celebrated Girish Karnad, attracted to this very building simply by being here. I was such a votary. He entered my life when I was a teenager. 
I entered his in his later glorious days in in this building in Nehru Center. In my seminar, because Divya put Goldsmiths next to my name, I want to talk about that. In my seminar on modern Indian theater at the university where I teach, I tell my students that we're going to look now at the work of a person I fell in love with decades ago because his new, much younger bride was in love with someone else and still she married him. And as they stare at me unsure about where I'm going with this, I tell, her, tell them that the whole generation of young, men who, uh, young women with me also fell in love with him. And then they relax knowing that there's some more. I once mentioned it to Farooq Sheikh himself, the male protagonist of the film, uh, with whom Smita Patil and I used to share television makeup rooms in Mumbai in 1970s, Bombay. We laughed because at that time, Arth, the movie, had not been made, nor was Bhumika. Both these movies were about female sexual desire. To my students in London, I finally clarify that it was a film, Swami, that I was talking about, and that the person was Ghansham, the character, not Girish Karnad, the actor, playwright, polymath, whose work we would study. And yet, a lot of that love and affection rubbed off on the original. The student's greater illumination was to see that the film and Karnad's own plays were of a time when female sexual desire was thought pretty much non-existent, if ignored especially, and it was surely much more sublimated than that of the Adi Yogi himself. Unsurprisingly then, the students would go on to find the frisson of sexuality as an existential trope of humanity and as well an organically feminist angle in Karnad's work and find it all too contemporary and old at the same time. Post-independence, when Western modes and theaters, works of theater and drama were still deeply embedded in the university syllabus, very carefully calibrated, and it was there in the language of instruction, the project of modernity or catching up with the world while recovering an identity took on an unprecedented emotional and existential urgency. Playwrights such as Girish Karnad and directors researched all the way back to Natya Shastra to see what kind of dramaturgical structures, acting styles and staging techniques could be used to create something indigenous, non-realistic style of production that could in turn define an Indian theater. So this came to be called the Roots, the Theater of the Roots movement, and it challenged colonial culture by reclaiming the aesthetics of performance and by addressing the politics of aesthetics. Um, and this is very, very close to Girish Karnad's heart. And this quotation is from Kevin Wetmore et al. Girish Karnad is then considered by scholars as one of the two outstanding and most renowned practitioners and an exemplar of this critical roots movement, the other being Kavalam Narayana Panikar. All the student bodies, all the colleges from around my times, for them, the place of Girish Karnad gave them an identity to be able to still speak in English, talk about old stories and feel relevant, much like we use a lot of things coming out of the younger world today to feel global. So Karnad has given generations of writers, theater makers, and spectators an invaluable gift. I'm not going to analyze his work, but he has provided us, I think, being in the Oxford Union and bringing his Indianness and bringing his Englishness back and taking both back and forth and going across. He has given us a model of cultural ambidexterity. That's the term scholars have put on him. An ability to successfully and easily operate in two or more cultural systems without privileging either one over the other. This is so evident in British Asian theater today as well as all the contemporary works still very confidently coming out of India. So, to conclude with puppets and masks, choruses and commentaries, song and dance, and he loved dance. Um, he came to a lot of dance performances to see mine and others and thanked me for introducing me to 
the amount of dance and the variety of dance we have here. And in his, in his own plays, he had gods and reptiles transforming as we do in dance, communing with humans. His symbolism was differently charged. The walls and the wings disappeared, time itself transformed as it did in his presence. Worlds collided as ideas bounced across eras and oceans and geographies, from Thomas Mann's transposed heads to Hayavadana with the talking horse, from folk tales to Naga Mandala to feminism and female sexuality. We see the excitement and the babble of multiple voices as a world of genres and ideas and imagination come, come into to the parade and comment on an otherwise single story. But is there ever a single story, a single point of view, he seems to ask, and has asked. And even if the answer is yes, then he'd say, don't we get a different view if we just turn the lights down a little bit, move to the right or to the left, and inhabit perhaps another space? Isn't that freedom wonderful to experience and understand the main plot in so many different ways? Make room for so many more to partake. So much more room for the characters to wander about and into our imagination and with them. Still wondering about my imagination and that of my students will be their creator forever. Who has left me and my generation and others so much and made us greedy for more. But he has shown that we can take and make and give from India and from the West, indeed from China and Japan and Korea and Nigeria and Ghana and Slovakia, from all these various wonderful places where my students come to the university, bringing their worlds to Girish Karnad in gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Chitra Sundramji. I now invite Sangeeta Datta to come over. Thank you, Divya and Neelam, for making this evening possible. As Chitra said, we all were acquainted with Girish in our teenage years through his films and through the films of Sham Benegal. We met him much later. I met him much later when he came to London as director of the Nehru Center. And I hadn't been here in London for very many years before that. And one of my most enduring memories of Girish was oh, one day when I walked in and he stood there characteristically with his hands appraised dramatically, saying, this is your home. This is the home of culture. Consider it your home. And it was this opening up of doors, making this whole space so accessible, making many, many memories and associations which have been possible after that, that makes really, really does create goose flesh today when, when I meet so many old friends and old faces who used to be here in Nehru Center so often and we spend so much time together. Girish, uh, with his plays, with his, which, which is what we read when we were very young, um, when we met him here, I think those discussions about translation, about mobility of languages and meaning, about mobility and making alive history and myths. These were, were really engaging conversations and discussions that we would have. And I think one of the most enduring ideas that have remained so vibrant and so dynamic is the, 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 the stress that he put on history and on the past to find meaning, to make contemporary, the here and now and the present meaningful, we need to look back and find meaning in history. We talk quite a lot about this. As I said, I hadn't been here very long, and so we would engage in conversations about what it really meant to be Indian. What did it mean to be an Indian artist? A lot of these conversations came up. I think Girish was one of the very few people with whom one could have this 
very broad spectrum of discussion, whether it was classical music, whether it was dance, theater and cinema and literature, of course. Where did we find another friend with whom we could talk about Shakespeare and even modern poetry and Tagore and Jivonananda Dash, all in the span of, a, of one evening? I'm sure many friends here will agree that the the, the breadth and the span of discussions that we could have with him were always so enriching. And every conversation with Girish was really something where we could take away food for thought. So making Nehru Center as dynamic as it possibly could be during the years that he was here, we're grateful to him for that. I remember and I have very fond memories of Girish coming home uh, home has always been a sort of pivotal center for artists and uh, writers and uh, actors who come home and stay and spend time. So we would have a lot of classical music at home. So he would be home, he would love his Bengali adda, his Bengali food. All of us knew about his great love for wine and for good wine and good conversations. And we would have the same up here in his apartment above uh, the floor here. And that brings me to a closer association with Girish a few years later when I made my feature film, Life Goes On. It was um, a sort of Indian adaptation of Shakespeare's King Lear and set in the contemporary world post 9-11, post London bombings, post the time when we were really faced with Islamophobia and we were questioning and really looking at feeling layers of identity in a way that I had never felt before. Uh, Girish was, I, I offered Girish the part of Dr. Sanjay Banerjee, the Bengali doctor who has three daughters and the youngest with whom he has the biggest conflict, the youngest with whom he loves the most. And it was during that time that uh, a span of four weeks really when we worked together and the months before that when we discussed the script. Again, a very, very enriching time for me. And to also see the sort of bonding that he had with another great actor who we lost today, uh, Om Puri. Om Puri used to be an FTI student when Girish was at the Institute. And it was just wonderful to see these two great artists, great minds bonding together during the course of the film. Um, you know, quite often we would finish their scenes and we'd hope that they would just go back to their rooms and we would relax a bit, but they wouldn't leave the sets. They'd be right there. They wanted to be with the younger cast. And I think with Girish, this was just so important. He loved speaking and spending time with younger people all the time. So while I was shooting with Sharmila Ji or Soha and uh, in another room or another part of the house, Omda and Girish would gather the rest of the British cast, much younger, and rehearse scenes. Come on, let's rehearse this scene for tomorrow. And so under the stairs, crouched somewhere in some little space, they would be very, very animatedly involved with the script and rehearsing for the next day's work. All of that was wonderful. Um, I also remember, and I'm very grateful that Girish um, had this great eye for talent, for, for discovering talent, and um, he invited Shomik, my son Shomik, uh, who was in school at that time, to perform his Sarod solo concert here, and to also have his solo art exhibition on the ground floor. I don't think there have been many artists who've had that sort of good fortune at the beginning of their careers, and uh, Shomik is blessed. I remember Girish telling me, ah, you have this multi-talented child. That's going to create a lot of trouble for you. And of course it has. <laughs> um, I think to end, I'd only like to say that at times such as this, when we are uh, constantly questioning identity, constantly questioning our location and our place as creative artists in the world, Girish's belief in a secular liberal world, Girish's belief in secular liberal artistry, his free will, his support against any injustice, that enduring image that we have of Girish with his 
oxygen tank, which he called his third lung, um, and the tubes standing quite frail in health, but standing in support of what he thought was right. That remains an enduring image. And I think for each one of us, leaves us with this responsibility of doing something for social justice, just as the way Girish believed the world should be. Thank you. Thank you, Sangeeta Ratta. I now invite Nasreen Rahman to come and say a few words. Dear Girish, I turn to you, for I know that you roam not just in the hearts and minds of the congregation here and of the people whose lives you touched, but you tread the boards here in London 